Hi everybody, hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Seven Logics of Sculpture, Encountering Objects Through the Senses uh, by Ernst van Alphen, published by Valets. For centuries, the Greek mythical story of Pygmalion and Galatea has served as an assessment of the nature of sculpture. Let me begin by telling this story, which grants a special role to the sense of touch. The legendary figure of Pygmalion, king of Cyprus, but also a sculptor, is said to have fallen in love with a statue he had carved of Galatea. It was not just seeing the sculpted body which made him fall in love, but touching it. The story is widely known in its Latin version of Ovid's prose poem in Metamorphosis. This is what Ovid wrote. Often he ran his hands over the work, feeling it to see whether it was flesh or ivory, and would not yet admit that ivory was all it was. He kissed the statue and imagined that it kissed him back, spoke to it and embraced it, and thought he felt his fingers sink into the limbs he touched, so that he was afraid lest a bruise appear where he had pressed the flesh. Pygmalion's relationship to his sculpture is highly physical and verges on the erotic. It is due to this physical and sensorial relationship that the sculpted body of Galatea comes to life, although literally it is in response to Pygmalion's prayers to Venus to let the statue come alive. In the words of Douglas Bauer, that the ivory statue melted to life under the loving touch of Pygmalion is surely the most significant feature of his, of its story, and the one on which this entire allegory hinges. On the basis of Ovid's story, Victor Stoicita concludes that the figurative sculpted body is transformed into flesh by feeling, touching, caressing and kissing, in other words, through erotic touch. To better understand what this mythical story tells us about sculpture, I will bring in another mythical story, also narrated by Ovid in his Metamorphosis, namely the Narcissus story. This myth, however, is not about the nature of sculpture, but the nature and origin of painting. In his book on painting, artist and writer Basari called Narcissus the inventor of painting. I say among my friends that Narcissus, who was changed into a flower according to the poets, was the inventor of painting. Since painting is already the flower of every art, the story of Narcissus is most to the point. What else can you call painting but a similar embracing with art of what is presented on the surface of the water in the fountain? The idea that Narcissus invented painting is rather surprising, given that nowadays we predominantly know of Narcissus through Sigmund Freud's interpretation the emblematic figure of self-love. But in the Narcissus story, touch also plays an important role, albeit a negative one. Ovid's Narcissus story is usually read as a moral tale about the avoidance of touch and the failure to touch. In his short life, he is touched by no one and touches nobody. Narcissus is traditionally seen as the fool who fell in love with himself, but in fact he was cursed by the gods for the specific reason that he refused to accept the physical touch of other people. Many youths and many maidens sought his love, but in that slender form was pride so cold that no youth, no maiden, touched his heart. In response to the loving gestures of the nymph's echo, Narcissus retorts, Hands off, embrace me not, may I die before I give you power over me. For Narcissus, touch is a force or a form of violence, which is understandable because he was born into the world as the outcome of the violent rape of his mother Liriope by the river god Cephisus. 
His self-love was the only alternative for a situation in which the touch of other people was taboo. Thus, it was not the cause but the effect of his dramatic situation. In contrast with Narcissus, the Pygmalion story was a happy ending. Pygmalion begins at first as someone who is revolted by the daughters of Propetus, who had been punished for insulting Aphrodite by being turned into the first prostitutes. As a result, Pygmalion will never touch them because he rejects physical love from then on. Whereas Narcissus and Pygmalion begin their lives with a refusal of touch, the latter is saved from his sad destiny by the physicality and tactility of sculpture, which he cannot resist touching. But how can the refusal of touch and tactility result in the invention of painting? Narcissus is affected by his own image and falls in love with it. That image is his reflection in the water, a mirror image of him. But in between Narcissus and his image there is a plane. The surface of the water separates the Narcissus who looks and the Narcissus who is locked at. The plane, as well as mirroring, is transparent. The visual drama of Narcissus, his attentive look, demonstrates the existence of such a plane, which is at once illusionary and real. Thus, Narcissus not only surrenders to a visual illusion, not only falls in love with an object that turns out to be an image, but in doing this he also ends up making the dramatic discovery of a concealed region hidden between the object and its reflection. With Narcissus, a new kind of human look is born, a deliberate gaze that, in its deep sorrow, can see beyond the object form of what appears. His tears ruffled the water and dimly the image came back from the troubled pool. What Narcissus sees for the first time is the inner layer of the field of visual appearances, a discovery that indeed inaugurates the possibility of painting. What Narcissus' visual illusion tells us, according to Keenan, is that the visuality of painting can open up to the viewer only on the condition that the eye forgets the claim of the body. The body of the exemplary viewer is thus one that neither moves nor touches. It assumes a given perspective, takes the form of a fixed point of view. This condition makes illusion possible by separating and thus singling out the pictorial world. It also marks a threshold which our body can never cross. But as already mentioned, our experience of sculpture is very different with respect to the role of the viewer's body. The viewer is not separated from the pictorial world a painting gives access to, but viewer and sculpture partake of the same world or dimension. This does not mean that sculpture is real instead of imaginative, however. Sculpture plays with the imagination in a different way to painting. Whereas illusionistic painting plays with the possibility of simulating depth or objecthood in a flat surface, sculpture plays with the possibility of finding life in formed matter. In other words, while paintings invite us to enter their world, sculptures are experienced through the possibility that they will enter and become active in our world. It is precisely because sculptures enter and become active in the world of the viewer that the viewer's body does not become separated, taking instead an active role in imaginatively relating to them. The two mythical stories of Pygmalion and Narcissus offer a perspective on sculpture and, differently, also on painting which is still relevant today. But one could say that the notions of sculpture and painting at stake in these myths are very dated. Since the beginning of the 20th century, a sculpture is no longer just a sculpted human body. Painting is no longer, by definition, an illusionary three-dimensional world. 
But what is most interesting about these two myths is that they dramatize and plot not only the sculpted or painted object, but also the viewer, their body and how they relate to these objects. They thematize and embody the kind of look that is conditioned by these objects. Hence, we can still learn from these old mythical tales. The Pygmalion story makes clear that the sensorial body of the viewer plays a decisive role in the aliveness of sculpture, and only when a sculpture is alive can it enter our world as an imaginative object or being. The tactility of sculptures make them touchable, and only on that condition can they become alive. This mythical narrative is allegorical and we should not take it literally. To give one simple example, we are not supposed to touch sculptures. We are supposed to walk around them and look at them. And sculptures are made of dead matter, whatever material they are made from, and can never come to life. So what does touch mean in this respect? And how does it make sculpture alive? Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.